Alright, welcome to part two of the games I am most excited for, for 2022. We already saw the honorable mentions of games where you just don't have enough information for me to put them in the list, or they just in general don't really, never really had a chance of making my top ten, but were still notable enough for me to want to mention them. And then of course you have number ten through six. Number 10 being WWE 2K22, because it's a sports game. Number 9 being Oxen Free 2, because while the first game was great, ending games like that aren't my like bread and butter to, to a giant degree. Like Oxen Free, Inside, Limbo, games like that I really love, but just in general, indie games, sort of like Super Meatball or anything like that, I just don't care for. Then you have number 8, which was Suicide Squad to Kill the Justice League, which just seemed like a non-stop, fun ride, versions of Guardian of the Galaxies with a variety of gameplay, comparatively speaking. And then you had 7, which was Triangle Strategy, worst title on the list in terms of its name. Tri Triangle Strategy, I get it. I get a theme and everything, but it's just a bad name, especially considering its code name is Project. Triangle Strategy, just like Octopath Traveler was Project Octopath Traveler, like, we're gonna reveal the name now! Stop the project. We're good, Triangle Strategy. We're, we're, we're good. Great naming, honestly. Chef's Kiss. And then you had Six, which, like Oxen Free, was a not triple A game. Uh, a Plague Tale Requiem. Um, a Plague Tale Innocent took me by surprise, and became one of, if not, not going to say not my favorite game of 2019, <laughs> Kingdom Hearts 3 and Resident Evil 2 Remake came out that year, but A Plague Tale in my top five for sure, and blew me out of the water, honestly. I loved it. So now, let's just jump right into this list at number five. And I'm sure if you know me, you knew it was coming. Starting off my top 5 is Pokemon Legends of Arceus, Arceus, however you want to pronounce it. This game looks to be an interesting branch in the franchise, not necessarily a mainline game, but certainly bigger than any spinoff before it. Save for Coliseum and Gale of Darkness on the GameCube, which were also pretty expansive. I'm pretty excited to see what new Hisuian, for Hisuian forms we see in this game, as the game is set in the Sinnoh region way before it was called Sinnoh, hence the Hisuian. We've already seen like Hisuian Growlithe, we've seen Cleavor, which is like Hisuian Scyther Evolution, or maybe it's just a different Scyther. Um, we've seen the Hisuian Basculin, the Hisuian Braviary, the Hisuian Zorark and Zorua. Which are pretty awesome. We've seen the Hisuian Voltorb. We've seen plenty of Hisuians, and I'm wondering if the starters will get that same treatment. Rowlet, Cyndaquil, and Oshawott. Oshawott's already got a pretty badass uh, legend, or not legendary, final evolution that's pretty ancient. Samurai being Samurai. Rowlet's kind of the same thing. Deucey Die being an archer. Cyndaquil's Typhlosion, I think, is the one that needs it the most to kind of fit in. I feel like Cyndaquil is the one they're trying to stretch for, because he is the starter that makes the most sense, but even then, he doesn't make as much sense when you compare it to Samurott and Deucey Die. So there's, there's certainly that. Um, and then you have this game, which everybody thought was going to be the, the Breath of the Wild Pokemon, but it's not open world. Almost. Like, uh, what was it? It was, uh, something story. Oh my god, what was it? It was a Monster, Honey Sto Monster Hunter Stories 2, or it's segmented open worlds, or something similar to, like, uh, Nino Kuni, where it's not quite open world, but you have segmented open portions of the map you can explore. That are pretty vast themselves, but just not vast enough and connected enough to be open world. So there's that, but anything's better than the wild area from Sword and Shield. 
the, the, the Wild Aryan Sword and Shield, while in theory is neat, the, the areas themselves, there's just not a whole lot of it until, you know, DLC expansion. But even then, they're, they're kind of boring domains. Nothing really too exciting, especially after the first time going through the area. I wouldn't say the first time. Maybe the first few times. It, it loses its charm and just becomes part of the motion. You, you don't really need to stop and look because there's just nothing interesting. So yeah, I've got a lot. I've got a lot of hopes for Legends of Arceus, but you know my my hopes aren't as wanted as others. And this game is also one of those with a release date being January twenty eighth, twenty twenty two. So let's see how well these wooden balls can capture them all. That's right, Pokemon Legends of Arceus. I mean. Were you surprised it was number five? I'm not. I, I'm, I'm sure some people thought it might have been higher, considering. But, you know, I am a huge Pokemon fan. Legends of Arceus, I was not sold on immediately. Mainly because everybody has this misconception that it's a mainline entry game. Do you agree? Kind of. But, like I said, in a sense, it, it seems to be like a sub-series spin-off, like Pokemon Coliseum and XD Gale of Darkness. Was it Gale of Darkness XD? I don't remember. But those two GameCube games, you know? The biggest thing going against this game might be overhype due to its similarities to Breath of the Wild, even though it doesn't look as pretty or as, uh, I guess you could say, as polished as Breath of the Wild in terms of its look aesthetic in gameplay because you can tell the difference Breath of the Wild looks better than Pokemon Legends of Arceus Breath of the Wild came out in 2017 yeah so you say that, that's saying something um but next on the list something new something that is the first be the only one of its series. Is it gone? Yes. And we should leave this place as well. Number four is Force Spoken. A new IP by Square Enix made in the Luminous Engine. You know, the Luminous Engine that they made specifically for Final Fantasy XV. They even had that tech demo for it. Well, Take them out a trailer for it to show off how good it could be, and everybody thought it was awesome and wanted to came out of it. But now it turns out making that engine has been more of a financial detriment than it could have been possible. If I remember, isn't Seven made an Unreal Engine because of that? Because the the Luminous Engine had some setbacks and limitations that they weren't expecting, but. I mean, I guess they gotta milk it somehow and make it at least seem somewhat worth it, so Forspoken gets to be the, the guinea pig, so to speak, to be in here. But the way this game looks like it's gonna play out is a modern hero gets sipped from her modern world, current day world setting, into a fantasy world and an action RPG. This looks like an action RPG with combat, magic, very real time combat like Final Fantasy 15. I don't know if it's going to be more intuitive like Kingdom Hearts or if it's going to be sort of like 15 where you get into a combat and it feels like a barrier pops up without a barrier actually popping up. Who knows? I, it never really shows her entering into a combat. It just shows her in the combat and zipping around. But the game does look like a more refined Final Fantasy XV and Dragon's Dogma. Which is good. I mean, Final Fantasy XV, I love it. It's one of my favorite games of the last decade. It really is. And Dragon's Dogma, that's what started my channel. I started my channel on Dragon's Dogma. That messing around series. I loved it. It was a lot of fun. Dragon's Dogma is so amazing. The story may be lackluster because there's not a whole lot of it, but the world design in that game is just great. And I have a feeling, and and that's where I really got the Dragon's Dogma feel in this trailer was with the world and how it looked. I, the, yeah, sure, the combat, the way 
they moved and gave them Final Fantasy XV vibes, but with a lot more zippy and fluidity to it, whereas, you know, Nocturne and the boys are human. <laughs> they can't jump as high as she can with that bracelet. They, they, they got normal jumps. She, she magical, dude. Um, but yeah, then the world design and the way it looked, it gave me Dragon Dog vibes. But, and like I was saying, the, the traversal system in this game looks like it's going to be so much better than 15. The way she just zips and jumps around, how fast it is, how cool it is. It's just very satisfying to watch. And one thing I did notice throughout the trailers is that the facial animations do look iffy, but the story being played out seems good. I mean, it, it, it's captured my attention, the story being told through the trailers. I just noticed that the facial lip syncing wasn't on point that kind of distracted me a little bit but not enough to really make me go mm, don't really want this I, I want this I really do um, and the characters are well at least Frey and her bracelet they, they seem to have good chemistry they had nice banter throughout the trailer I can't really say anything about the others because they're just they came off archetypal which isn't necessarily a bad thing but they didn't really stand out because you didn't get enough time with them to really get a big feel for what they were. But that being said, this game looks amazing. I'm super excited for it. It's PlayStation 5 and I think PC only. Um, and this game does have a release date. It is May 24th, 2022. I honestly can't wait to start jumping and zipping from one end to the other in this game in a forespoken kind of way. That's right, number four was forespoken, and why did forespoken beat out Pokemon? Knowing that I'm a huge Pokemon fan and have been since 2012. Wow, I've been a Pokemon fan for almost a decade now. The game's a the game series is as old as me. It's not sponsor me. Nobody sponsors me, but that's fine. Um, yeah. Um, a lot of people are lukewarm with the series. Like, you know, I, I see the comments of, yeah, this game looks good, but yeah, the, the series looks like it's going to be a snoozer. And it's like, no, it doesn't. I mean, maybe if you're cynical to the point where you just don't care about stories anymore, and you just want sort of chaotic, fast paced action RPG gameplay, then I guess. But the story looks good. I mean, it looks like it could be a contender for narrative of the year next year, if not a game of the year candidate. That's just my opinion. But speaking of a game of the year candidate, I think all three top spots, maybe even my top five, all of them could be potential game of the year. I don't think Pokemon Legends of Arceus will get in there as a, as a nominee. Forspoken is 50-50. It really depends on the reception and how well polished it is at launch. If it's broken like Cyberpunk, it's, it's not going to do well. But this next game on name value alone, honestly, I could see just being a nominee for game of the year. Oh, right. Number three is Horizon Forbidden West. Honestly, the moment I saw Horizon Zero Dawn, I knew I was going to love it. And I waited it until the, you know, the Frozen Wildlands version came out. Where you got the game with Frozen Wildlands automatically attached to it. So I waited till I got that, or to buy it physically. I borrowed it from my brother-in-law first, then played it played through the main campaign and then bought it when that version came out and played through the DLC, the Frozen Wild Dance, and it was amazing. I adored Zero Dawn so much. It's a run-down world with remnants of the old world when tech ran the world. And now it's almost reverting back to tribal Stone Age-esque eras. The world is taking back what we took away from it. And that is an interesting concept that I love. And I love to explore 
those areas, the, the remnants of the old world, to see the, the run-down tech and all of that stuff. And I felt like the first game didn't have a lot of it than it should have. I mean, you see it here and there, but it's always bigger scale areas. There's not really small ones. And now Forbidden West seems to be adding those smaller ones where you see ships, planes, smaller little remnants in the underwater that the sea has risen above where you once had buildings and all that stuff. And not only that, but, you know, the enemy pool in Forbidden, or in Zero Dawn, wasn't that big. It wasn't as big as it could have been. It, it definitely, with as long as the game was, it was getting repetitive with the same enemies over and over and over again, even with the bosses. Um, the only one that really doesn't appear that much is the mole one, which I didn't beat because it was just too annoying and frustrating. But Forbidden West seems to be adding many, many bigger machines that were not in the first game, and whether that's a good thing or not for me, I don't know. Because so like I said, I couldn't even take on that mole. I mean, the T-Rex and the bird were almost enough for me, and that's saying something. And this is gonna, this is gonna be, I don't know if this is gonna be controversial or not, but the first game was so big. That map was huge. And part of me wants Forbidden West to be smaller. I will be ready. And that's not saying much. Because smaller could mean by not that much. Because like I said, Zero Dawn is a huge, huge land where you just got like this land mass over here. And then a large one over here. Like literally, the beginning section of that game's map could be a game in itself. You can make a whole game out of just that portion of the map, and then you can make a whole game out of the second portion of the map. They're that huge. Honestly, I, I, I don't know. Part of me wishes it could be huge and just decrepit with areas to explore the lore. Part of me wants it to be smaller so it's not as much of a pain to traverse. But either way, I am ready to explore this forbidden land. Like, it is Shadow of Colossus all over again. That's right. Horizon Forbidden West, the game that shook the series to its core because nobody knew what it would be known as. Horizon Zero Dawn, everybody thought the game series was going to be Horizon Zero. Or something like that. Or maybe it was just be Horizon Zero Dawn and sub something. No, this, it's Horizon. Horizon Forbidden West, obviously for sure, I think will be a game of the year contender regardless. The game looks amazing. It looks gorgeous. Aloy's a fantastic character. Sure, she's not the most charismatic, but I mean, not every main character needs to be a charismatic swab like Ezio or Nathan Drake. Or, uh, I mean, you have characters like Laura Croft too. She's engaging. I mean, she's, she's charismatic in kind of a different way. She's not like Nathan Drake or you know Ezio, where they're so suave and savvy and witty and you know, funny, and they have their like leadership moments. Or doesn't have that. She has that underdog, vulnerable kind of feel to her. But then she's a badass because she survives all of this stuff. And Aloy's kind of got that vibe to her, where she seems like an underdog coming up from behind to save the day or whatever. And just like a, I guess you could call her sort of a pioneer, uh, someone who pushes the boundaries, a rebel, you know, that kind of archetype, without being, like, overly witty. More of, she, I think she lands more on the dry humor kind of side, but, eh. You have to balance out your witty characters with your serious characters. And, and Aloy's fantastic. I mean, the game's gonna do fine regardless, in my opinion. And it comes out in February. February 18th, which I believe Horizon Zero Dawn came out February 17th. Oh, correct. By the way, if, that, if that's true, then that's kind of coincidence. Almost. Um, yeah, I, I lied. This next game, I don't know if it'll be a game of the year contender, but it's certainly a game I am heavily invested into seeing it be brought to light 
and uh, not failing. Because I know most games where you create your character from scratch in some kind of way, like Dragon's Dogma, for example, as far as my knowledge goes, um, you got Skyrim, Fallout, those kinds of games where the story isn't really the full front focus. It's more of like the background lore and that kind of stuff. And the side characters are the ones to really carry the game. So I think we're going to get something similar to that in this game. And then obviously everybody always wants a really good Quidditch. I think the moment we saw those Hufflepuffs make those rooms fly up into their hand, we're like, oh, 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 really? Are we actually getting the Quidditch? Now, I hope it's as good, not not as good, I hope it's better than what was in the first two games and then that Quidditch game, the spit-off one, Quidditch World Cup. Phenomenal game. I love the Quidditch in those games. They're well done. But I hope this game can fine-tune it a little bit. <clears throat> but I just really want Quidditch in the game so bad. Maybe dueling, potions, you know, mini games like that, gobstones, snaps, you know, just add as much mini games for up to Wizards Chess. I'm just thinking of them all off the top of my head from the <laughs> Prisoner of Azkaban and Half Blood Prince. Prisoner of Azkaban. No, uh, Order of Phoenix and Half Blood Prince. And then obviously dueling. A lot of people have been talking about spell casting. How do they want the spell casting? Repetitive, like Half Blood Prince, Deathly Hollows Part, Half Blood, Deathly Hollows Part One and Two, or the analog stick control, which is my preferred method, or the one where you attach a spell to a certain button, which it looks like that's the one they're going with based on the, the pre-leak um, footage where you see the spells kind of locked on like a square grid. X square, triangle, circle, X, you know, that kind of thing. So it looks like you're assigning a spell to a certain button instead of, you know, assigning a spell to a certain analog movement, which I would prefer, but, you know, what do I know? Half-Blood Prince only had the best dueling and spell use in the entire series. But that's, that's just my opinion. But, yeah, this game, so amazing. We can only hope for just another great magical adventure. Yeah, my, my number two is Hogwarts Legacy. Um, so the reason why I chose the words heavily invested in seeing this game come to light and do well is mainly because Warner Brothers scared. Warner Brothers is afraid for some reason of the backlash this game could get getting announced release date due to J.K. Rowling's Twitter account, so to speak. Um, the Secrets of Dumbledore? Fuck it, dude. Throw that trailer out there, you know. I, I saw the trailer pop up on my screen today, and I think it was released yesterday. Yeah, Secrets of Dumbledore, you know. It's a movie that she's tied to. Yeah. Throw that shit out there, you know. For sure. Um, with the release date, you know, it's already had one, but it's like April 15th or something like that's going to theaters. And it was confirmed to be the first major Harry Potter media to come out next year, aside from January 1st's HBO 20th special, which J.K. Rowling is not a part of. But this game, Hogwarts Legacy, is not tied to J.K. Rowling in any way, shape, or form. She does not have her hands on it. She's not involved in the making, the process, the writing, nothing. She has no control over what is put in this game and how it is released. That is all Avalanche Software, the game developers, and Warner Brothers. Gives the okay to release anything news about it. To be fair, I don't think this game will get Game of the Year just because of the kind of game it is. This kind of game only does well if it's Elder Scrolls or Fallout. You know what I mean? It's like RPG character you create from the ground up. It's pretty much disembodied and all the other characters around them is what make the story entertaining or lasting. But even then, Skyrim and Fallout don't really have good stories. 
mean, they have passable stories, good stories, I guess, but there's nothing like great groundbreaking, nothing Uncharted level, nothing Horizon Zero Dawn level, nothing Final Fantasy level, or any of that. So for that reason alone, I don't think this game would get nominated for Game of the Year. If it did, I'd vote for it for sure, but I, I, I doubt it. But this next game, if indeed it does come out, because this is another contentious one, and it's number one, not even confirmed to come out in 2022, is a potential 2022, or a, as he put it during the 35th celebration, a hopeful And of course, my number one has to belong to the only one on this the only one on this list that doesn't have a title yet. Breath of the Wild 2 doesn't have a title yet because apparently the title is so giving of what the theme of the game may pertain to, which I guess makes sense. But you know, I had to digress. At the end of the day, it is more Breath of the Wild. I'm gonna love it ten out of ten. No, honestly for real what we all want and i'm sure all of us are in agreement about this is classic dungeons and distinguishable boss battles that go along with the theme of said dungeon we all want more unique boss fights i mean don't get me wrong the divine beasts were cool i liked them all but they all felt the same when it came to its look obviously the design and the puzzles were a bit different <clears throat> but the look of it all was the same and blended and it wasn't differentiable other than maybe the puzzle and the bosses the Ganon blights while well, thematically I mean they're kind of cool and it does make sense from a theme standpoint I mean you can't help but feel they were largely underwhelming I mean aside from Thunder Blight Ganon the other three were just more of the same but with a different element attached that uh, I, I don't I don't know what to say. They just weren't great. They were okay. There was nothing terrible about them, but there was nothing great about them. And the only one that stands out is Thunderblight, which is an issue. But I mean and like I said, shrines, cool. We don't need to do those again. And if you do, slash that number in half. 120? 120. Really? No, 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 no. If you're gonna do it, do less so they make so they stand out more. Your puzzles stand out more. You don't have to stretch your brain then with over twenty strength tests. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, just get rid of the shrines or shrink it in half and stick with the side quests, because this game has outstanding side quests, and in my opinion, is probably the best side quest Zelda game. Aside from Majora's Mask, in my opinion, it, this game has strong side quests, so it should stick to that. Like I said, get rid of the shrines or shriek them half, bring back the dungeons, and bring back distinguishable boss fights, and we're going. Nothing can stop you. But I am so ready to jump back into this Hyrule once more. That's right, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild 2 doesn't even have a release date. And it is hopeful to come out in 2022, as Anuma said, not potential. I guess potential and hopeful are kind of the same thing in terms of release dates. So it is not a guarantee 2022, and if it does come out in 2022, I, I would assume the standard holiday time, October, November, December, somewhere in that time frame. Because if it was going to come out around the same time Breath of the Wild did or in the summer, you would probably hear about it within the next two months, and you probably would have seen something at the Game Boys. But there wasn't. So, yeah. But if it does come out this year, I think it's a guaranteed uh, Game of the Year nominee, like Horizon Forbidden West, just on name value alone. Unless the game comes out in such a horrible state, that's the only thing that can knock it out. Forspoken, I think, is a sleeper to get Game of the Year nominee, but I think it is a potential. Hogwarts Legacy, less of a potential to get there, but I think, possibly, you know, if the stars align. And Pokemon Legends of Arceus is kind of in Hogwarts Legacy's uh, boat, but I don't think it will. Just, just because if Breath of the Wild 2 does come out 
in 2022, the same year as Pokemon Legends of Arceus. Legends of Arceus has no hope. I'm sorry, Legends of Arceus is an inferior Breath of the Wild. So to speak. The game doesn't look as good. It doesn't look like it's running as good. And uh, that's that. But I'm still really excited for Legend of Pokemon Legends of Arceus. Don't, don't get me wrong. So there's that. So yeah, starting at number 5, you had Pokemon Legends of Arceus. Number 4 was Forspoken. Number 3 was Horizon Forbidden West. Number 2 was Hogwarts Legacy. And number 1 was Breath of the Wild 2. Name later to be announced. I still haven't announced the actual name for Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild 2. Which is a shame. But it is what it is. And with that, enjoy how my Christmas tree... Sorry if the camera's shaking. It's on my coffee table that rises. As you can see, I cannot put a topper on the tree. So that right there is my makeshift topper. It's like a star with a bow underneath it. They're separate ornaments. And, uh... I wanted to show you a little one, yeah? This is alright. Luna, look. Look. Look at the camera. Yeah, this is my pretty black cat. Luna, Luna. She's a precious baby. She's our first cat. Um, still remember when she plopped her on the bed in a cage. What a wooden box. Plopped it on the bed, I'm sleeping. I'm getting ready for my midnight shift. So she just dropped it on the bed and left, and I was like, what is in there? She's like a cat and left. There, there's no wound at she went down. We're gonna let her down. You've already seen Loki, so I'm gonna show off the other cats. Um uh -oh. uh, you might have heard that. This is Momo. Yeah. You already know Momo from Momo's Great Adventure. Maybe she's in. She's the oldest. She's seven. The other ones are like two and three. Isn't that right? She's the one who gets angry very easily, so I'm gonna put her down now. Alright. So let me know down below, what are your top 10 games coming out in 2022? Maybe not top 10, but what are your few favorite games that you are undoubtedly looking forward to or hoping even comes out next year because it doesn't have a release date or it's just a release window of 2022. So with that, from my household to yours, happy holidays and a Merry Christmas. Um, this will be coming up on Christmas. So I'm going to schedule it. So I hope you do have a Merry Christmas. I hope you get wonderful gifts. Hope Santa is very kind and doesn't bring you coal or your family for that matter because that would be a rude, cruel family. Um, yeah. Hope you have a great day. Remember only you can be the best you you can possibly be. If you like the video, like, comment, follow, it's super special, awesome, subscribe if you haven't. That really helped me out. And ta-ta for now.